What up, everybody? It is your boy, BQ. Welcome back to the channel. If it is your first time here, you are clicking on one of my uploads for the very first time. I have been rec recording on my cell phone the last couple weeks. Um, should ho I'm hoping to have my computer repaired by the end of the week. And hopefully the streams will be back to normal and um, just overall overall recording. So let's, uh, let's hope we can get that quality up sooner than later. Speaking of quality, the one thing I'm not going to talk about here in talking about sacrifice mm -hmm. is the the production snafus. I've already talked about it enough my last couple of uh, recordings. So I'm not going to beat a dead horse. Um, it, it is what it is. We know what's going to happen almost every show. Of course, it's never been as bad as it was for Sacrifice. But there usually is at least one segment of show where we have an issue. Whether you people catch it or not, you know I do. But we're going to ignore that. We're just going to talk Sacrifice, which I thought was a pretty good show. It's very rare that these monthly specials, the TNA, TNA Plus shows, it's very rare that they're not good. They're usually very, very quality. You can put them up against any wrestling pay-per-view that's out there. I've had two gripes regarding them. One is that I think they go a little too hard. Um. You know, if you look at the sacrifice card, this was excellent. And I have a hard time imagining the rebellion card being better. This was a very, very much so a pay per view worthy show. And in that same breath, where I say they go too hard, I just think, you know, that the company is a smaller company, it has a smaller roster. And I've always said they don't need to defend every single title on every show. And um, Ali was safe on this one because he was in a six-man match. But I would just like to see more of that. You know, I don't think the world champion should be defending every single month. You know, there's no reason he can't be in tag team matches. The knockouts titles certainly do not, to be, do not need to be defended every single month. The other issue that I kind of have, and my phone keeps vibrating, I apologize, uh, I just keep getting messages. The other issue that I have is that it's three hours long. And I have very little desire to ever watch three hours of wrestling. But I guess when you're trying to sell tickets and it's a live show, you want to give them more bang for your buck. But I would, I would honestly rather it be a two-hour show and then they record an episode of Impact after. And then the next night, record a couple more episodes, and you and you get a little bit more in the can that way. But the shows are too long for me. You know, I, I stopped watching wrestling. Uh, excuse me, wrestling. I stopped watching Monday Night Raw eight years ago, and I pretty much completely stopped watching AEW pay per views because they're like nine hours long. I I've got two hours in me, <laughs> so you know those those are my gripes for the most part, but. I thought they did a very good job with this show. They've 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 improved the the pre-show matches. You know, they they continue to be very quality. I just don't think they do an a uh, very good job of convincing people to order whether it's TNA Plus or pay-per-view. I mean, like we know we're watching a pre-show, but they never seem unless I'm completely missing it you guys let me know if it's just completely going over my head but I just don't ever recall them having a really strong call to action where they say hey you know the pay-per-view is going to start in 30 minutes this is how you can order I mean I, I guess sometimes they do mention ultimate insiders and in fight but I feel like it just it, like in passing I feel like it's just so quickly done I just don't think it's a strong call to action that's um that's my opinion. Otherwise, I would remember it. Um, before I get into the show, I am not covering Impact from this last episode. And to be honest with you, I didn't even watch it. I may catch that uh, Kevin Knight and Ali match. I have some interest. No, I don't think he was facing Ali. Because wasn't Ali teaming with the Good Brothers? I don't know. I, I, might, I might catch a couple matches. But for the most part, I don't really care to watch. The main reason... 
Um, you guys know I'm never satisfied with commentary. And I talked about this at the end of my No Surrender review. Although I acknowledge that Tom Hannafin does a very good job and Matt Raywald do a good job, I can't handle their voices for that much in a week. You know what I mean? Um, and of course, I'm going to nitpick the shit out of Tom Hannafin because I do with every play-by-play announcer. But the one thing that he does that drives me up the fucking wall because it's just like nonstop is that every time there's a there's a two count, he hits you with and I'll kick out. Like he he never says you know two count. Uh, oh, only two. Oh, that was almost three, two and a half. Thought he had him there. Nothing. He doesn't switch it out. Every single time it's, and I'll kick out. And sometimes he'll throw, you know, and I'll kick out by moose. But for the most part, like at 80% of the time, it is the same, and I'll kick out. And it drives me fucking crazy. So I can't watch that. I can't watch two hours of impact and then then watch like three hours of the of fucking sacrifice. That just, I just can't handle it. Um. You guys know I get annoyed very, very easily. I'm um, I'm very introverted. I love to be by myself or be with my family. I don't particularly like being around people. Not that I hate people. I'm not one of those like, oh, I dislike people. I just, I'm a lot more content um, in a quiet environment and being by myself. So, you know, and a lot of it is because I do get annoyed by people very easily. So... That's why I kind of pick up on those little, you know, intricate details about someone like Tom Hannafin, um, just because that, that's just how I am. That's how I'm wired. So I just can't, I can't watch that much fucking impact in a week. So hands off, kick out. Let's move on. Listen for it next time. It's 80% of the time. So um, let's move on. Uh, Joe Hendry took on Crazy Steve. I actually had no clue this match was happening. So I must have missed the announcement. Again, it's a title match where it doesn't really need to be one. And I do like Joe Hendry, but Joe Hendry gets he he's he never ends up on his ass. Like he always one ups his opponent in every way. I talked about last week. AJ Francis came down and. I don't remember exactly what the angle was. I think it's when he did his video. That's what it was when he did his little diss song. And then it's like Joe Hendry had to have just so happened to have a response in the can. You know, like how come how come Joe Hendry can't look weak some weeks sometimes? Uh, but he took on Crazy Steve here, Steve here for the title. I did think the baby Steve, lazy Steve, 80s Steve was pretty funny. AJ Francis was on commentary. I particularly like AJ Francis. He is a character that does do something for me. I know he can't wrestle. I know people don't like him. Um, I think he's a very uh, middle-of-the-pack rapper. And I am qualified qualified to speak on this. I would say he he's he's above average. He's above average. He's got some lines that are, are very clever. Um, but the, re- the reason I say it's above average is because he often follows them up with something very weak. So it's like he kind of puts a lot of effort into half of a like into one bar and then the next bar is just phoned in. Um, but I but I do overall enjoy him. And he was on commentary. This, mass, this match ended when Francis threw him into a post and then Crazy Steve hit the Belladonna's kiss. And Crazy Steve wins. And um, the one thing that was just so, I don't know why wrestling companies love to make their referees look like goofs, but... The, the reaction of the ref when Joe Hendry got thrown into the ring where he, I don't even remember if it was a dude or, a, or, or one of the dudes or one of the girls. I just remember they were completely like, how the hell did he get in the ring? He was just outside a second ago, like threw his arms up in the air, complete, you know, foolishness on their face. But uh crazy Steve wins as he should have. And then we got um, a little backstage with Steve Macklin. This happens and, and uh, with Macklin and the Rascals. This happens every wrestling pay-per-view. Does not matter the company. There's always the angle 
where someone's cronies or partners or whoever talk about, I'm going to be out there with you. And they respond with, no, I got to go this alone. This happens every fucking show. So um, this was this was it happening here. The Rascals took on Speedball Mountain. I thought this was another really good one. And I've, you know, I, I've said many times Speedball Mountain's not my favorite team in the world, not my favorite name in the world, that's for sure. But I thought the two teams really displayed a lot of chemistry. So so I enjoyed the match and thought it was a very nice pre-show uh, type of move. They did a, a doomsday blockbuster that I thought looked excellent, and I thought it should have been the finish. This this match got a little a little AEW ish as far as just kind of kicking out of everything, and I'll kick out. Um, and there was the spray paint to the face that should have been the finish as well. I know that's a story they've told fifty million times, but there was spray paint to Mike Bailey's face and. Within 45 seconds, Mike Bailey is on the offense, completely unfazed by the uh, spray paint. And spray paints went. I mean, there's no spray paint. There's no nothing on his face. You know what I'm saying? They're just spraying water. And then Wentz gets sprayed. And, and again, Bailey is no long, longer blind at this point. And uh, Speedball Mountain ends up winning. Um, after this is when the production issues began, and I think it lasted like three matches or so. Um, man, these messages don't fucking stop. I, I'm, I wish, I wish, folks, that I could just record here. This is just one of the issue with these cell phone things, you know. Like I wish I could just record, and and shit just doesn't. I don't know. It's like Murphy's law. It just continues, continues. So if you're hearing those little vibration noises, I, I'm sorry. Like I. My cell phone is like a cheaper cell phone. I mean, it's not like a flip phone or anything, but uh, my previous cell phone I had paid off and I was like really proud of it. And then it, I don't know if this has happened to you guys before. It, it ha it's happened to me about four times in a row. Um, you pay off a phone and then it turns to shit about a week later. I mean, it's the craziest thing in the world. And I was like, no, I just paid off this expensive phone. I'm not, I'm not doing it again. So I kind of got a, a cheaper one. So I can go into the settings and turn off vibrate and all that. And it just doesn't stop. It doesn't work. Like it just still vibrates. It's so it's pisses me off. Anyway, um, Nick Nemeth took on Steve Macklin here. Tom Hannafin first timed Everett us to death during this match. And um, the problem was that's how he's also promoting the main event. So it means nothing when the main event rolls around, if you say it 500 times in the opening match, Tom, this was another excellent fucking match. It, it's had a, a good build. And the build was maybe out of necessity. It wasn't that it was a good build, but it was out of necessity. We've had to wait for it. I'm always a big fan of waiting for a match. I cannot stand when there's an angle one week and all of a sudden... We just get the match the next week. Like, I just want to see, just make me wait for it a little bit. So this was kind of out of necessity because Nick Nemeth wasn't even around. Um, and again, this is when you can start hearing the crackling and all that. It's, it's you know, it's whatever. Um, I was still able to follow the match pretty good for the most part. The big highlight was Macklin flying out of the ring, going for the crosshairs. I mean, he just completely flew out of the flew out of there you know i would have ended the match there um I, I would have just thrown a count out we don't get a lot of count outs i know they did that double count out the knockouts the other day but the count count outs are not overly used if you watched wrestling in the 80s i mean 70 percent of the matches felt like they were count outs or disqualifications you know they just they always had a they kind of did that because for the most part they would make you wait for the pay-per-view for actual finishes where they just had people they didn't they didn't want to beat, you know they they kept a good number of people strong, and I would have just counted them out here, and then kind of find a way to continue the feud because Nick Nemeth has already beat the Rascals, so he's he's just running through this stable, so I, I would I would have prolonged it just a little bit, but he comes in a ring, he plays possum, and um, 
there was a lot because of just like I know I said I'm not going to talk about it, but I'm just stating, the, you know, the the production issues kind of really kicked in here to where we kind of missed a lot of the action. Um, and then it came back in, and Macklin was yelling "fuck you" to one of the uh, fans in the crowd. And then Nick Nick Namath eventually wins with a danger zone. And he did so with hitting him with a, a super kick first. And it looked a little more realistic because this is another stupid finisher where the wrestler stands there like a goof. Um, it's it's more obvious when they played in slow-mo, which you know TNA obviously loves to do. They'll they'll play, you know, they'll play one of his segments in slow motion, and they just look like idiots waiting for him to land that move. But he won, and it was um, a very good match. And uh, Steve Macklin and the Rascals all lose to start this thing off. They did a v- very good TNA merch commercial after this. I kind of laugh when they said order now before it's all gone because, um, I mean, there's they probably have still have Sting shirts and AJ Styles sitting around, you know. But I thought it was a very good merch commercial. And then we got the system versus ABC. Another good tag team match. I was uh, very pleased that the system won here in the new tag team champions. I was pretty confident they were going to win. And um, we got a couple title changes on this episode. We're going to get on this show. We're going to we're going to get to another one here pretty soon. But um, I think having the system all be champions is a breath of fresh air because I can't think of a stable in TNA in a while that they've done that with, you know, um, I always thought when OVE was around, you know, give Sammy the title and put the put you know the belt on Dave and Jake, you know, but they just just don't really do that kind of stuff. What I've what I've always pointed out is that majority of the time stables are a leader and two losers or three losers. So we're we're starting to get some stables here in Impact right now, which is kind of nice. I I am a stable guy, that's why I really like the early days of AEW. You know, once they kind of transition out of stables, going to more like trios and everything, I'm like, eh. But yeah, the system wins are the champions. I I love it. I can dig it. Khan took on PCO in a no disqualification match. So all these matches are the same, right? No disqualification, Monsters Ball, Street Fight. What else they got? They're, They're all the same matches, right? When I was young, they would do a no disqualification match, but it didn't mean it was so the wrestlers could just bring out a bunch of garbage weapons and have a garbage match. It was due to heels that would get themselves um, intentionally counted out, intentionally disqualified to not finish a match or to not give up their titles. So they would do like a no disqualification match so that there had to be an, a winner. There had to be an outcome, you know, a clear, defined outcome where the titles either stay where they are or they change hands. So that was, that was kind of the difference once upon a time in a no DQ match versus a street fight. But this was a street fight. This is um, this is what it was. Khan took out the timekeeper again, which I completely th- forgot he did before. And, um, you know, this was not a Matt classic by any stretch of the imagination. What was really weird to me, though, is that PCO won. And you're, it's like they're trying to build this whole baddest man in TNA brand with, with Khan. Trying to build him as a legit big man, legit monster, right? I don't understand why he lost here. Because in today's wrestling world... We're in a world where the smaller guys, the smaller guy usually seems to beat the bigger guy. It's pretty hard to create a monster these days because the fans don't have a lot of interest in the bigger wrestlers. Or they don't think the the matches with the bigger wrestlers are as good. And you're pushing this dude, Khan, the last several weeks, breaking him away from Diener, and he's doing this silly neck snapping move. And you're trying to do something with him. And then you put him in his first big feud and he loses. He's not the easiest guy in the world to heat up, folks. 
like a wrestler like this requires months of fucking work <laughs> if you're going to take him seriously as a as a big man as a as a threat it take it takes maybe not months but it takes weeks it takes several weeks of consistency to get him to a certain point he has a match with PCO and we have our answer who the baddest man in TNA is i mean did PCO need to win this match the only reason this makes sense is if Khan is out of the company. Because now, now he's right back to like bodyguard or the muscle for a stable. Like you can't, this was your only chance to do anything with him as a singles competitor. Because again, you cannot heat a guy up like this just out of the blue. There's certain wrestlers like Rosemary. If you need to heat her up for a world title match, you can do that. If you need to heat up Eric Young or Frankie Gazarian or... Um, Eddie Edwards, you can do that. You can heat him up fairly quickly. You cannot heat up Khan. So everything that you've done the last couple months is gone now. You've done away with it. It's completely out the window. If he's out of the company after this, then it makes it makes sense. But if he's still sticking around, I do not understand this. And I hope it doesn't mean we're getting another match. You know, <laughs> It was kind of like when Frankie Gazarian and Eddie Edwards kept fighting, and they're like, they they were like, okay, one more time, we're not doing this again, and then they fight, and then they fight again, you know, like they said here. Now we know the answer. Who's the baddest? You know, it just Khan could have benefited if we're if we're gonna have to sit through one of these matches, have Khan win. AJ Francis does a promo, which is always great. Hendry comes in, and it was good to see Joe Hendry get angry. We have a lot of goof Joe Hendry segments. It was it was just good to see him get angry. And this is this is really the most consistent story in TNA right now that's just like consistently going. It's you know, they're not giving us the match right away. It's been a couple months. You know, so I I will have interest when it eventually happens here, which I think is happening on impact, I think they said. MK Ultra took on Danny Luna, excuse me, Danny Luna and Jody Threat. Just a week ago, I referred to them as Jobby Luna and Danny Luza. Folks, never in a million years did I expect this new team of Spitfire to win. I have been saying MK Ultra is the best thing to happen to the Knockouts Tag Team Division since they reformed it. And um, there's no money but, but behind Spitfire right now. Like, you cannot take them to Rebellion as the champions. Who the hell is going to give a shit who they fight? To where MK Ultra, that's the kind of team you take into a pay-per-view. So, um, this pissed me off quite a bit. Um, let me rewind here real quick. <laughs> I know I made a comment about Khan and PCO that um, back in the days they did it because the, the the one of the guys would intentionally get disqualified. I know Khan got disqualified the previous time, but but my I, I just forgot to say this to, just so I can be clear. It was in the past. It was done in a heel in a in a, in a cowardly way. The heel would do it in a very cowardly way. That's not really what Khan did last time. He just got disqualified because he was getting crazy. It didn't, you know, it, it wasn't because he didn't want to finish the match. So <laughs> let me just throw that out there real quick before someone gets in a comment. But like, well, he did get disqualified last time. But anyway, um, MK Ultra wrestles Danny Lou and Jody Threat. They attack him before the bell. And this isn't even really a match. Um, Killer Kelly didn't do a lot here. They didn't show the camera on her much on the outside. Masha Slamovich was doing all the work. And um, when the match started, she did all the work. And then she got Killer Kelly got tagged in and she got rolled up. So this might mean that Kelly is hurt. I'm, I'm going to meet her in person here in about two weeks. So uh, I will find out. She has a advertised match that night. So we're going we're gonna to see. 
Um, she takes on like, it's like a four way with Zaya Brookside and a couple indie girls. I was in our brace for impact chat. We were talking about this and I thought it was a joke when they were saying that MK ultra lost in a couple of minutes. And these two were the, ty- were, the were, the, were the champions. Like I thought it was a joke. I really did. Um, I, I don't see a lot in either of these two girls. And who am I to say that, right? I'm not a wrestler. I, I haven't laced up the boots. I'm not um I'm not saying they're not talented in their own right, but I just I don't think them as the tag team champions, I just don't I don't think it really gets over with the, the fans. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're gonna come out and just be this huge baby face team. You know, cool. I'm just I'm having a little bit of a hard time seeing it. So I'm going to assume Killer Kelly's hurt. Masha pushed her after the match. I don't want to see them fight. I just want to see them find creative ways to bring to bring girls in to challenge them. It's always a one or two team division. And they've just gotten so far away from when they first tried to have the division and all the girls were paired up. You know, Deanna had, um, shit, what's her name? Uh, Kimberly. Uh, we had uh, Kylie Ray with with um, Susie. Was that her name? Was she Susie? Um, you just had girl. You, you you just. I mean, everyone just had a partner. That was kind of when um, Tasha Steeles and and um, Kira Hogan first started. But there was like a good solid six teams, and now they struggle to put together more than two. And what I said from the very beginning. Before the belts even had, you know existed, is that uh, you know I'd make them touring belts. I would wrestle all over on the indies. I would bring some girls in from the indies to, to challenge. Like, there's some creative ways you can defend the fucking titles. And um, if you, like for those of you who watch NWA, they have a women's tag team division as well. They do a pretty good job of of pairing girls together. To where it's not totally random. Like everyone does kind of have a partner. Kind of like it used to be with with Impact years ago. And then they find girls off the indies to bring in who are tag teams. Like right now the... What the hell are they called? I want to say the Killer Bees. But it's something like they're like... They're girls but it's like a male name. Like King King Bees or some shit. I can't can't remember off the top of my head just showed up out of the blue from the indies and they won the the tag team titles. You know, like there's there's girls out there. You can you can put them together. I'm going to bring a picture up here real quick. The um the knockouts on knock National Women's Day took a picture. Actually, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to hold off on that. I'm going to do a separate up- upload talking about the knockouts division. So, I'm going to hold off on that. But yeah, this did not make me very happy. I'm just I'm just not really a big fan of of uh, either of these girls, I just thought there was a lot of money with MK Ultra as the champions. I I thought they should have been champions forever, like like no shit. I thought they should have just had them for the entire year. So I don't know who the hell they're going to wrestle. Decay. I mean, two babyface teams. Why did MK Ultra win the titles back to begin with? I have to assume Killer Kelly's hurt. So we'll see. Josh Alexander took on Alexander Hammerstone. This match was not as good as their previous one, but it was very good because there was a completely different story being told here. When they announced it, I thought it was too soon. I thought it was too early. I was like, we don't really need Alexander versus Hammerstone too, especially on these Impact Plus shows, which is probably, as I said, probably has less people watching than Explosion does. Um, So I didn't... I you know I didn't think it was necessary, but now that I've seen the match, I've seen the story. We got the amber, the the hammerstone the heel turn. I'm kind of like okay, I can I can see now because they're gonna wrestle again. I said it at no surrender. I said all these matches we're gonna see again, and then I'm kind of feeling that way with some of these in sacrifice as well. They're just matches we're gonna see again, and um, the the reason this is interesting is because I'm. I'm willing to bet this is Josh's first legitimate feud since joining Impact several years ago that did not involve a championship. 
And I've mentioned this in my last couple of recordings. I had that at the top of the year, I had said, I said, um, the big challenge for them is, is can they make Josh Alexander compelling without making him wrestle for a championship? The story has always been championship gold and working towards titles. I mean, from the beginning, since he was teamed up with, with uh, Ethan Page, it's just been about championships. He hasn't had, at least not that I can remember, a legitimate storyline that didn't just involve one match. Let's go out there and have a good match. Or two matches, maybe. A legitimate storyline where he wasn't the champion. So he's got a, a feud here. Him and Hammerstone. And I'm here for it. I think it should be really interesting to see how they how they handle this on um, television going forward. Then we got... Um, Mustafa, Mustafa, I can never say it. Oh my God. Ali and the Grizzled Young Veterans versus Time Machine, uh, Kushida, Alex Shelley, and Chris Saban. I, I, I was actually really shocked that, shocked that the Grizzled Young Vets showed up, showed back up. I thought they were done with the company when they didn't win the titles. And again, as I said, I didn't watch the episode of Impact, but I think they mentioned that Ali, you know, had the good hands and brushed them aside and kind of replaced them with these dudes. I think that's what happened. So uh, you guys can can fill me in on that. I thought this was another good match, even though, um, even though a lot of the matches were, I mean, a lot of the moves, excuse me, were so pre rehearsed, and I just. I, I struggle getting into the matches where every, you know, three three guys on the same team are all going for the same move and doing everything at the same time and and um you know obvious obvious combo moves that are that are pre-rehearsed. Like it's just not my style of match. But even though I tend not to to enjoy those kind of matches, I thought this was good, especially because they're telling a little bit of a story with Alex Shelley. He wouldn't let him do their poses when they came down to the uh, wouldn't let him do their entrance when they started coming down to the ring. So they're clearly setting up his heel turn, which should be good. Ali looks like a star. He comes out like a star. He has the music of a star. And I've been very critical about Impact theme songs over the years, especially Josh Alexander's. And um, this guy has the entrance of a star. And I just think you have to follow that uh, for the people who you do want to be stars. Like Moose has a star entrance of a star. Eddie Edwards does not. Josh Alexander does not. Eric Young's is better. Um, a lot of these guys don't. And I think they need to work on that a little bit. Um, eventually, the good hands got involved. They were dressed like the Secret Service. So I don't know if they're just going to continue to follow this dude around or or what happens, but... Uh, what ultimately happened was Shelly accidentally took a boot by Saban, like a halluva kick basically in the corner. And then Grizzly Young Vets hit the grit your teeth and then Ali hits the 450 splash and pins the former world champion. So if these guys remain a stable, Ali and the Grizzly Young Veterans, they could be a very dominant group. I hope they're not trying to like do a trios title thing in Impact because they're starting to put trios together. I hope that's not where they're going with it. I just, you know, I kind of enjoy the the heels. I don't enjoy these fucking texts that um, keep coming through. But we're almost wrapping it up. Zaya Brookside versus Tasha Steele versus Jordan Grace was after this. This was so much better than I expected it to be. At the same time, Jordan is so much better than the both of them and better than the entire division. Like, this is just a game to her at this point, you know? Uh, there's there's no one on her level in the division right now. I think Kylan King going out really hurt things because they could have really done something interesting, something very special. This tag, this uh, knockouts division is a, in, in a lot of trouble. So they had to do a three-way. But I thought it was good. I keep saying I think Zaya Brookside has the potential to be a major baby face for this company. I think she's very likable. I think she's good. So we'll see if that's that's the direction they go. But I think I think she's just got a lot of potential. They had a lot of really cool combo moves here. There was a muscle buster 
like she, I think she clotheslined one of them and hit a muscle buster. There was a bulldog into a front slam combo. There was a lot of combinations here with the three girls. It got a little sloppy towards the end where they, they were obviously pre-rehearsed, but um, it was it was entertaining. I was entertained with this. And it's probably the best multi-woman match that I can remember that the company's done. I, I, I really sat there and tried to think about it. When was the last time they had like a triple threat in a knockouts division? And it was, it was, you know, really, really good. I just can't think of one. Uh, but this was, I liked, I liked this one a lot. Moose took on Eric Young in the main event. And, you know, again, Tom Hannafin, first time ever at us to death uh, during this whole thing. And, um, you know, one of the reasons that I give Tom a hard time when he calls everyone by their last name all the time is because you get away from the branding of the wrestlers. There's sometimes where it is appropriate, you know, but uh, I think he does overdo it. So if you're a random fan turning tuning into this for the first time, you just know that this guy's young and that's it. He just young, 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 and I'll kick out, you know. He hit us with that, and I'll kick out by young. But it's like you just get away from the branding of the wrestler. And that's why a lot of the time commentators just call wrestlers by their full name in the match because that's what makes them stand out. The, the young, the name Young is a very common name. So now you're making him just some common dude, some average Joe, some schmuck, where Eric Young is Eric Young. He's a wrestler for TNA. But anyone could be young. Is it fucking Nick Young from the NBA? I mean, it's just, you know, I just think it's necessary for branding to stop doing that. Um, Moose made me laugh at one point because he called a fan a fat tub of shit. And <laughs> fucking wrestling fans, man. Um, Eric Young kicked out of the spear at one point. This is something that wrestling companies do, which I hate. So because he kicked out of the spear, they needed to paint the picture that Moose could kick out of the pile driver. So you kick out of one finisher, they always make you the the uh, and they always flip it around and then the opposite guy kicks out of the opposite finisher. And they needed Moose to kick out, so they did three pile drivers and then he went to the outside and hit a Canadian destroyer. Now he didn't kick out. They pulled him out of the ring, but they still it was the same general concept. And Frankie Gazarian ultimately comes in and costs him the match. You know, Tom Hannafin with what the hell that he likes to do. Frankie Gazarian was dressed like, uh, you know, a cameraman or something. I don't know. I don't know what he was exactly, but um, he cost Eric Young the match. Very similar to the way that um, AJ Francis cost. Joe Hendry the match in the opening night and uh, in the opening match. This was a little different because he threw him into the the um, the pole and then I think Frankie Gazarian just kind of choked him here with some kind of cable. But it was you know it was the same general finish. And then um, <laughs> you know I had to laugh because he said Frankie Gazarian was was um, was suspended up till this morning. How long was the suspension for attacking the referees? Two weeks. He, what it was two weeks without pay. He went without half of his pay for the month, and then you activate him for the the morning of a show. You would think you would suspend the guy through the show, but yeah, that's what you get for um refer you know attacking a referee. You get like one or two weeks without pay, and then you're just kind of like back to normal again. So he'll probably just do it again. But yeah, Moose wins. He's a champion. Uh, the system works. They're the champions. And I can dig it. They've got a couple, you know, they've got a couple threesomes. <laughs> threesomes. They've got a couple threesomes looking pretty strong in TNA right now. One that needs a little help, which is Macklin and the Rascals. But overall, again, I thought this was a very, very quality show. Production issues aside, I thought it was one... Um, one of their better ones. And, and as I said, they're usually pretty good. But but I felt this was one of their better ones. I do have concerns that the Rebellion card will not be this good. 
But I guess we'll see. You know, they've uh, they've proved me wrong when it comes to that before. I'm your boy BQ. We're almost at seven thousand subscribers. So if you're if you're first time here and you're still hanging out, consider hitting that subscribe button. But I am your boy, and I'm out. Peace.